The name of this word today is the fountain gate. Everybody say fountain gate. God gave me a prophetic word on April the 3rd, 2016. Of course, that was eight days before Pastor Hen went to be with the Lord. So time frame, go ahead and give you an idea of where that was in perspective. Number eight is the number of new beginnings. So I thought that was significant when uh, I look back over this in my notes. This is what the word that God spoke to me and just dropped in my heart during worship while we were here, worshiping as a body. And God spoke this. He said, the doors, the gates, the windows are open now over Believer's Church, only waiting for the word to come forth. Once spoken, the outpouring will begin, a rebooting or reset of all things, restoring those things to order that need to be restored. There has been much mourning, but now the night is over, the morning has come with much more joy. It is time to stand in the full armor, having done all you can do, and now see the salvation of the Lord. It is time to burst forth. This is our destiny, by the way, guys. This is who we are, not only as a body, but as, a, as a individuals. To the, the people here, the glory and the beauty is not for you alone. So in other words, God's glory and beauty is going to come on us. It's time to go and to touch those who come in your midst, your oikos. Let my beauty be shown in you. Walk in that light. Wow. Was that on or what? For such a time as this and where we're headed to. Amen? So today is really going to be built on this word. It's a prophetic word. It's dealing with the gates that God put uh, in place around Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem, I believe. It's uh, symbolic with the city of David. But we're going to start off here in verse 16 of Matthew, or chapter 16, verse 13. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, man am? This was Jesus. He was speaking to the, the 12 that were with him. And he wanted to see what they said. What was the revelation of Jesus Christ in their hearts? How was that going to impact them and what they were going to take from that point on? And how were they going to walk in that and other people will see it? In uh, verse 14, they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias, others, uh, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. There was a place where he came in an encounter with the living God. It was manifesting in his life right there. God revealed to him the truth. He opened his eyes to see, his ears to hear, and he recognized Jesus Christ for who he was and what he was about to do here in this world. The Messiah. Blessed art thou, but, uh, and that's what we do, guys. When we make a quality time to get along with Jesus on a daily basis, when we consecrate ourselves to him, when we worship him, when we get in this word and begin to study it, and it becomes a life to us, becomes rhema. That's what we begin to do is to be uh, revealed or have revelation of Jesus Christ, not only into us, but it comes out of us as well as it did with Peter later on. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that rock of revelation of Jesus Christ, personally, a relationship, I will build my ecclesia, my church, my assembly, and the gates, everybody say gates, gates, of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So we've got a gate there we've got to deal with of heaven, of, of hell in this case, but it's, it's also of heaven. It can be either or, actually. And there is a key to this aspect of uh, the spiritual walk that we walk in. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now what's the, uh, the ecclesia really mean? Who are we? Now here in the West we think about the church, coming to church on Sunday morning, uh, doing three or four or five songs, worshiping God, taking up an offering. Uh, maybe visitation time in there, perhaps. Uh, well, obviously there's going to be a word that's going to come. Maybe a meal afterwards, and that's church on Sunday. 
Is that literally what this word ecclesia means? Well, it does mean assembly. It does mean church. But you go back into the day, Joe, when, when Jesus was walking, the Jewish perspective of an ecclesia was not what we think of as the church here in this country. Nor was the Roman mindset that same thing. It was totally different from this. The Jewish perspective was, in Jesus' era, a people assigned to govern the affairs of a city, a people assigned to govern the affairs of a state, the people assigned to govern the affairs of a nation. It was a Congress or a Parliament. It was not sitting on the bench on Sunday morning while somebody gets up and, and performs a worship that was really good and gets the goosebumps going. It's not about somebody getting up and performing a great, extravagant, stirring, emotional type message. It never has been that way and never should be. It's been Sound just go off on me? Okay, back up. The Roman understanding of the ecclesia was an assembly, a group of people who were sent into a conquered region. Listen to that. A people, a team that was sent into a conquered region. This is the ecclesia. This is what the church is supposed to be. Their purpose was to govern, to alter the culture, to become assimilated with the Roman culture, or in this case with us, to the Christian culture. Has that happened at Auburn University? If we walk over there, do they relate and reflect the, the standards ethically, morally, the language, our understanding, the way we think? Is there a reflection at Auburn University with who we are as a Christian nation? We all know, obviously, that that's not the case. So somewhere we've lost understanding in this and, our, and accomplishing this here. To implement Roman ideas and ideal, uh, ideas in all areas of the culture. In other words, it was a group given the responsibility to act in unity of purpose and bring in the social structure, the government, the language, the education, the entertainment, the art, everything of the Roman Empire to a conquered land. The ecclesia today should be a people who first legislate spiritually the kingdom of God, then they extend physically his kingdom and his influence on the earth. There's a spiritual dynamic and there's a physical dynamic. We should be moving into both of those. Now, the place that the ecclesia would sit in the gates in those ancient times were called the gates. That was a place, a meeting place for them. They would sit there, they would have their parliament, they'd have their judges sit there, uh, judicially ruling, and but really the word, and that word judicial, and all the implications on that are not just the judges sitting on the throne or in the courtroom. It also deals the president's executive branch. It also deals with the legislative branch. All wrote in that one term in the, the uh, Greek and the Hebrew. But it's a place of the ecclesia meeting where governing councils meet to make decisions. And they have keys which open and close those doors uh, appropriately. Now, the gates of the city were very, very important. Most of them had a name. They represented the way that that gate was used. They defined its effects on the lives of the people in the city. And they were directly related to who or what was allowed in and out of the city itself. It ID, just like in people, uh, the name of, of God, all of his names, they indicate his character, his purpose, his reputation, everything along that line. But the ecclesia seated in the, the gates judicially bring in on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we should be doing. That's our purpose to increase the kingdom in all areas through the gate that we sit in. Now let's go over to Nehemiah chapter 3 and let's just see how this plays out and how important this is in, in uh, God's mind, his heart, and how this is laid out. There are ten gates in the old city, the city of David. As they expanded the city on out and built more walls over the course of time, they, they actually added a couple more gates to it. So there were 12, but for our purposes today, we're going to deal with 10, uh, divine order, spiritual manifestation there. So we go here to Nehemiah chapter 3. In verse 1, then Elisha, Elishib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. 
going to verse 3. Uh, but the fish gate did the sons of uh, Hassanah build, go on further. Verse 6 talks about the old gate being built. Then you go to verse 13, it talks about the valley gate being built. You go to verse 14, it talks about the dung gate being rebuilt. Actually, I'm saying built, but they rebuilt a city that had been destroyed and sacked when it had been attacked years ago. Then verse 15, but the gate of the fountain, which is a very important gate for us, was rebuilt by Shalom. And then you're going down to verse 26, you have the water gate toward the east. Verse 28 has the horse gate. Verse 29 has the east gate. Verse 31 has the gate of Mithcad, which is the gate of examination or inspection. Ten gates, each one having a very specific purpose. Each one dealing with Jerusalem. Not only the, the city of David, but the new Jerusalem to come. A picture of what God is doing in us as we become a member and a citizen of that new Jerusalem when we're born again and begin this adventure called a Christian walk. Amen? And you can see that in the picture of each one of these names. The Sheep Gate. Let's go ahead and put that picture of the, the map up here, please. Is that visible? Can y'all see the names on there okay? If you look up at about uh, between 12 and 1 o'clock, you see on the north side is the Sheep Gate. Everybody see that? Then you go ahead and move counterclockwise. You have the Fish Gate, uh, the Old Gate, come on down, uh, the Valley Gate, the Dung Gate, the Fountain Gate, the Water Gate. And then you go on up, and there's the east gate. And then finally, the inspection gate at about 1 o'clock-ish or so. Sheep gate, what would that be indicative of? When you go and you look on the map, and it doesn't show it here, but right inside the city, actually it does show it there. You see where the temple is. That's a blessing it's on there on that one. I, I missed that. The sheep gate is the place and the only place that the priest would go forth and they would bring the sacrificial lambs through that particular gate and take them into the temple to sacrifice them unto the Lord as a part of their, their, their purposes and their duties. It's the only place in the city where there was redemption that came in to the city. It's a picture of Jesus Christ going to the, the cross for each one of us, Him dying, going into hell, being raised from the dead, now sitting at the right hand of God. But that was the beginning point. That's where the blood was shed for us. That was the place where everything begins with us as a, as a Christian. That we have a, uh, come into a place where we come in confrontation, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, with what Jesus Christ did on that cross. And either we're going to receive that and understand that I cannot make it. I'm in a desperate situation spiritually. I will never be able to make it to heaven. There's no way I can do that in my own power, in my own strength and my own good, good uh, sweet skills or whatever I've got, my good looks. It's not going to happen. We come into confrontation with the living God here. And there's blood, blood that was shed for us. Then we go into the fish gate, which is next, as we're moving by the tower of Hananel. The fish gate. Either I am caught or I'm going to swim away. God told us, or Jesus told the apostles, that they were going to become fishers of men. So there's that aspect that's there too. After I'm born again, God expects me to go out and reproduce myself. I'm going to re reproduce in the flesh and or the spirit. Am I going to produce life or am I going to produce death? The only way life is going to come forth is for me to receive Jesus Christ and, as Lord and Savior. Go ahead and get hooked. Allow him to go ahead and bring me on in. And then he's going to start skinning me. Sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? How many's been skiing? I mean, that's, that, we laugh about it, but I mean, it's, it's not a lot of fun. But God begins to clean us up after that. So now we see that picture of the witness being caught ourselves, salvation being received, becoming fishers of men. So we see the redemption comes forth, that offer. Now we've got a choice to make. Now we go around to the old gate. Everybody say old. This is the foundation of God's word. I began to get in the Word. When I first uh, began to live for God, and this was after I had been in the Baptist church and been raised up from the time I was very young and graduated from high school, God began to get my stuff when I was 28 years old. He began to speak to me to go into the Word. He was going to speak to me through this. So I would go in my prayer closet, not just reading, but I'd seek His face, and He, he would download to me, go over to Micah chapter 2. 
God, is there really a Maka in the Bible? So I'd go over to the table of contents and look it up. And yeah, there was. And so I'd go over and I'd begin to read that. And boy, the word, I'd get in that. It would be for that day. God would, his Holy Ghost would breathe on that word and it'd jump off the page. And I would see something come that day that I did not expect where I could use this word. And he would take me from the redemption having dealt with that. I was caught. Now it was becoming life to me. He was showing me how to do the walk, to walk the walk. But I didn't know. Nobody told me that the valley gate was coming pretty quick. And it was right on the hills of that. Anybody ever here walk through a valley? The valley of the shadow of death. There are a lot of th good things up on the mountaintop, the peak. But the growth comes when you get in those valleys. That's where it's going to be. So there was some Holy Ghost sandpaper that was put on me over the course of time. Even as I was still getting this word into me, God began to do a work inside me to change what was in here. I was broken. I had times of brokenness. Anybody here know what I'm talking about on that? God cannot use us to become comfort head to head, face to face with the flesh that's in us. When tests happen, it's not when we're testing God except that one time he says to do that when we bring in our tithes and offerings and he says he's going to supply and he's going to show us these there on that. The rest of the time these tests are for one reason and one reason only, JB. It's to go ahead and work him in us. For us to bring, to bring us to a place where we come face to face with what I really am and what he's expecting me to be according to this word. Looking in this image, this magnifying glass, but also a, a, a looking glass and seeing my image here of who I am and beginning to become the man of God, the woman of God he wants me to be. Now this is critical in this season of the manifestations of the sons of God that he wants us to be. Am I going to go out and try to build another Egypt? Or am I going to try to build the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey that's coming forth and welling up like rivers of living waters out of my being? Or am I going to be like these, the, the uh, folks in the Western church here that are trying to do it with a religious spirit and go up and set all these uh, programs and all this other junk in place that has nothing to do with an encounter with the living God? Now here in this place, we're going to have an encounter with God. We're not going to come in here and just play church on Sundays. We're going to go out, we're going to see people born again. We're going to bring them in here. We're going to help God to or just do, be allowed to be used by God in, in equipping them and, and getting them cleaned up and sending them out as well. So going further here, the Dung Gate. Anybody guess what that's about? Every living organism's got something that's got to be uh, taken out called toxins, right? What about bitterness, unforgiveness? What about racial bias? What about bias toward members of the opposite sex? Now, can we go on and on? We could, couldn't we? There's stuff here that God begins to work out of us. And in this city, that's where all the garbage was taken out to a place where it was burned outside of the city gates in the city of David. So we see the redemption being offered to me, the sheep gate. The fish gate, I've got to make a decision, quality decision. Do I receive what Jesus Christ did on that cross or not? Do I also receive the lordship of the Lord himself and going ahead and selling myself out to serve him? Then I've got the old gate, this word. Am I going to believe what it says or not? Am I going to live by this? And allow this to be a part of who I am. The valley gate, the trials, the tribulations, becoming better instead of bitter. Becoming better instead of bitter. If we're walking through something right now, a trial, a tribulation, am I going to allow God to work in me what he wants to work in me? Or am I going to become bitter toward what I'm seeing there? Because see, again, please listen. The only reason I'm going through a trial, I have not been obedient to line my life up to this outright when God speaks it. If I am faithful to begin with to receive this, these trials, these tribulations... There may be some I'm going to have to go through, but they're not going to be as hard and as, as extensive as what they are, probably are in my life right now. It's on me to go back and allow God to change me and to do the work in me he wants to do. Everybody understand what I just said? To allow God to do the changing. I can't do it. It's going to have to be from his presence and what his word does in me. 
And then all the garbage is going to come out. And then we get around to the fountain gate, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the washing of the water of the Word on my mind, my mind becoming renewed. Rivers as living waters welling up from my belly, equipping me to go forth in power and raising up people from the dead. Praying for those that are sick and seeing, expecting, expectation that they're going to be healed when I pray for them. And I'm shocked if they don't. Healing and receiving your healing is not based on magnificent mega faith. Healing is based on childlike faith. Now I don't know who that's for today. You don't have to work up a whole bunch of faith. The same, same faith that you have when you receive your, your uh, salvation, go back, you know, you, that's a, a teaching for another day. It's the same faith. If you are born again, it's the same faith you use there. You just believe God for what he said he's going to do. Healing is for you. He doesn't want to just do it. He's doing it if you allow him to receive it. It's there for you. The fountain gate, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the water gate, the washings, Coming forth there, cleansing and refreshing. Now, once we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, that's all there is to it, right? That's all. No, it continues on. There's multiple infillings and washings of God's Spirit in our life. He cleanses us continuously. The image of Christ being birthed in me, coming out, and, and all the junk being washed away. Again, the dung gate has already come through, so this is an ongoing process. This is getting to a place where the big stuff's already out of the way. Anybody ever notice those little things that are still there in your life that you don't ever seem to, you just hope God just go ahead and take this from me. Yes. Amen. He cleanses it. He cleanses it where people are not affected by it. And then we come to the east gate. Yes, the gate of hope, the blessed hope of Israel, the resurrection from the dead that is ours. Begin, beginning to come, I'm sorry, I skipped one, didn't I? Where's the horse gate? You know they don't have it labeled? Wow. Can y'all see where that gate is? It's right below the east gate right there, isn't it? It's got two towers on it. Y'all see that? That's supposed to be the horse gate. That's supposed to be in, uh, symbolic of the warfare that we get in. We do have an adversary. He's roaring like a lion, seeking him he may devour. He is going around looking Right now, judicially, right now for something he can find on you, Kaylee, to kill you, to take to the courts of God. And God judicially is just, saying the same word twice. And he will allow him to come in and, and do what he does. Unless we realize what that is and break those curses off of us and start entering the warfare and get uh, righteous indignation is a good word. Anybody ever get that way with the devil? I don't know, Samantha, do you like to be killed, stilled, and destroyed on all the time? Nobody likes that, do they? Jesus said that he's given us authority over what? All the power of the enemy. So now he's also given us the weaponry of our, our warfare, which is mighty, to pull down the strongholds. He's given us the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, integrity walking in that, preparation of the gospel of peace with the sandals, the sword, the word, that he's got the shield that's, that also deals with faith there, and prayer. If I say prayer, prayer, you can't leave that out. If you start doing that, you miss the whole uh, aspect of the, the weaponry and coming into play and engaging the enemy. Anybody can sit there with armor on, but it's not going to do any good until you're fighting, right? So there's a judicial aspect to this that we're going to as we get into prayer in the coming days. And that's the horse gate, for whatever reason, has been left off up there. Then you go to the east gate, the blessed hope of Israel, resurrection from the dead, the revelation of Jesus Christ coming forth, because that's the gate he's going to go in when he comes back to claim his kingdom. Amen? Symbolic of that. Then you've got the final one up there at the top, about 1 o'clock. The Mifkad gate is the way it's worded in the... the uh, the Greek, or the Hebrew rather. That is the gate of inspection, the gate of examination. This is a place that we're in right now. Anybody ever heard the term consecration? 
Consecration means this. I finally get to the place where my hands are going to be his hands. So that means if he says to go out and chop a tree down every day, take it and give it to Pastor Lane for his firewood collection that he needs at the house, which is a good thing. I'm not saying, don't bring me some firewood, guys. But if he says to get up, go get your pajamas on that have red spots on them and run around the church building, every worship service, outside, seven times. If he says, seriously, to give the tithe, the taruma, to give an offering to Pastor Seraphine, to take the finances he's given me and begin to understand that all of it's his, that I have a stewardship only to do what he's called me to do and organize my finances and be a steward where I have more than enough and sow in the right places where that increases where I can continue to sow where he's calling me to sow. It's taking my relationship with my spouse to the level where I begin to see that that's uh, Jesus' provision for my flesh here on earth and that we are to be one together to be complete to accomplish what he's called me to do in the kingdom of God. Therefore, I'm to take this as being precious, protect this relationship above all others, and do nothing to see that cut asunder and broken apart. Amen? The words of my mouth, life, not death. Not, oh, woe is me, here we go again. Devil's to eat my lunch again today. No, I'm more than an overcomer. I'm a conqueror through Jesus Christ. So we have... Dealing with my redemption. Am I going to take it or not? We're going to take this word or we're going to throw it away? What about these things called trials? I walk through those and become who I am through them. Brokenness, we are the only worldview that exists that looks toward brokenness as being a positive because of we become who we really are through that. The dung gate, allowing the junk out. The fountain gate, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then the water gate, washings, multiple baptisms. The horse gate, going into war, spiritually, walking it out physically. Blessed hope of Israel, the east gate, and then consecration, 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 consecration. It never ends, by the way. If I hear someone, and y'all listen, watch people's lives. Well, I've come to such a glorious state of spiritual growth. You know, I, I feel like I've just arrived. Just what they, they put that in prison. Yes, I, I'm defeating all the forces of hell. Uh, y'all just need to be around me. We'll be, everything will be fine for you. Uh, I'm going to suggest that you get away from that person very quickly. There's a brokenness. It's a reality of who we are. There's a humility that's there. And God is going to deal with that if you hear that in somebody. Amen? So, we're looking at these gates. I'm sorry, these, yeah, these gates. And what they mean, what God put into place. Now, there's something about these gates that's uh, very important to us. Well, let's zero in on this first. The fountain gate, specifically. The fountain gate is located at a spring. It's on the southeast quarter of of the city. That spring is flowing out of Mount Zion to Jerusalem. Mount Zion was the mountain that Jerusalem was actually on. So it's coming forth out of the mount, uh, mountain itself. There's something peculiar about this particular fountain that's there at the fountain gate. When it comes forth, it splits into two. And there's a double portion picture that comes forth from this. One part goes to a reservoir that the people in the city would drink water from. This is very important for us because this is the gate we're sitting in right here in this city, perhaps this whole area. I know that the uh, Opalaka means what in the Indian language? Big swamp. Big swamp. It also means a place of waters, lakes, springs, and creeks. That's what it means in the, in the uh, Creek language. I believe it's Creek, isn't it? Whichever one it was that were there. So that's very indicative of where we are here. It's a place of waters coming forth and bursting forth in this area, you go over and do some work in Opelok and try to put a house in or something, and water's everywhere. I mean, it really is. Water table's pretty low, most places there. But it's water, it splits in two from the spring, 
Part of it goes in the reservoir for the city, which has not been shown up on this. The other part goes to a place called the Pool of Salam. In uh, the scripture here in Nehemiah, as you're going down in there, it, it calls that the Pool of Silo. Now that is a place where eyes are healed. It was the place where Jesus had the blind man come up to him, and he, he got the clay and put on his eyes and told him to go wash his eyes. And so that was the place he ran to and washed his eyes when his eyes were healed. Historically, even the Turks looked at that when they occupied this city as a, as a pool that had some kind of medicinal value in the healing of people's eyes. Eyes to see, ears to hear. One of the big things that's coming against us in this season where we're sitting right here now is a deaf and dumb spirit. It's affecting eyes and ears here. We're coming against it. We're warring against that to get it off of us. See, the enemy knows what this place is and who we are. So he's trying to come in with a counterfeit to keep us from being what, who he's called us to be. Now, the Pool of Salaam was a place at the Feast of the Tabernacles, symbolic of the coming of the Messiah, where they drew water and they took it and they poured it on the altar. We were just talking about that today, weren't we? From the fountain gate, the water was poured on the altar. The water was drank by the priests when they ate too much uh, meat. It was also used to wash away uncleanness. And in, in uh, Nehemiah's time, that was a place where everybody went to wash before they could go to the temple. So it's talking about washings. It's talking about holiness. It's talking about purity. The fountain gate, it represents the Holy Ghost who works with the word to save and to well up within people's, uh, God's people, giving them new energy, the life of Christ, the ecclesia. Again, this is washing with the water of his word. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all that that entails. Now, sitting in each gate around these cities is a gatekeeper. Everybody say gatekeeper. What do gatekeepers do? They open and shut gates. And what do they have to do that? Put uh, Isaiah 22, 22 up there, please. There are spiritual keys that God gives us when we sit in gates like we're sitting in here. Now this prophetically was given to me by one of the, the prophets for such a time as this. I didn't go seeking it, didn't look for it, but I've never really done that anyway on most everything God has done. But this is symbolic of who we are and where we are right now as gatekeepers here in the fountain gate. This gate needs to be open. The reality of gates in the spirit realm is this. There are historical places that are high places where when a group of people go into a city and they found it and they consecrate the land of Jesus and they put a church there and that generation that comes in and the generations to follow, that's going to be ground where there will be people praying and worshiping. People will be able to go there for generations and be blessed by God until that people grows uh, lukewarm and begins to fall away and they begin to get in compromise. At which point and at which time there will be that gate will be closed from being a place of blessings to a place of wormwood if they're walking in bitterness as a people. And so that's something that becomes indicative of those people in that area. They'll be walking in bitterness. They'll be some of the most bitter, mean people you'll ever meet. At that point, the gate is closed from being a gate of heaven where the heavenly host is sin and descend, and it becomes a place of, of hell coming forth, and that will affect the people that come in that place. So God gives these keys to us at different times. You want to put that up there? Isaiah 22, 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn over here to it because I want to go ahead and look a little bit ahead of that too and behind it. Verse 20, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant to come forth and I will clothe him with the robe, strengthen him with the girdle. So we're talking about authority that comes in on us. We're talking about the girdle, the finances, the sword, faith to go into warfare. I will commit the government to his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now I know this is a picture of, of the Messiah, but this is a manifestation of Jesus Christ coming on the, in the flesh here on earth in his body as well. The key is used to open up what God has laid on the shoulder 
of the Messiah for such a time as this. The kingdom of God increasing here in this area. Now fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. So we're talking about the house of God becoming glorious here. We're talking about porters. Everybody say porter. That's a gatekeeper. That's somebody that God appoints to be in the, uh, over the gates. Now, historically, you'd have the watchmen who would be in the towers. That's the prophets. Then you'd have porters who actually were responsible to open and close gates. In the cities, they work very closely one with another. You'll see often where there'll be a, a reference to somebody that was on the tower who would see a runner that would be coming to the city or something that would be outside the city gates, then they would shout to the porter to shut the gate. There is a prophetic aspect to this, not only for the watchmen, who are the prophets, but also the gatekeepers. So there's, there's a commonality that's there. So these people are going to be men like David, men after God's heart. They're going to be worshipers. They're going to be warriors. And they're going to be rulers. Now, in the Greek, and this is, I believe, is very, very uh, prophetic for us right now. This key right here. This is cool. In Genesis, I'm sorry, in the Greek. Let's go there. Not, we're not going to go to Genesis right now. 22:22. That particular word means life. This is what comes forth from the fountain gate. It means of absolute fullness comes forth from this fountain. Logos, the word. A life active and devoted to God. That sounds good, doesn't it? But listen to this carefully. You can't make this kind of stuff up as a gatekeeper. The keys of David. Isaiah 22, 22. In the Hebrew, 22, 22 means drop. It means dripping. It means soaking. It means a saturation. It means a flow. It means a pouring rain. It means the waters of God coming forth in such a point that there's no drought. There's no, the, the desolation is totally removed and washed away. The fountain gate. Now we're going to stop here today. And I'm going to really get into detail on what the fountain gate is next, next uh, week when we come in, Lord willing. Just because of the time factor. But I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all what this is about today. Because this is very, very important for us. Let me back up in my notes because I want to make sure I give you all, all the different perspectives of this. Be accurate with it. Two to three years ago, in our staff meeting, we were discussing several different things. This was Pastor Ann, Pastor Hammock, and myself. We were looking at the things that had gone on in the church over the course of the years. We were trying to be sensitive to the voice of the Spirit as God was speaking to us. God spoke to us at that point that we needed to change the name of Believer's Church. Now, at that point, we kind of looked around at each other and said, you know, is that something that really is God? I mean, we had this name at that time, 27 years. Is that what God wanted us to do? So we began to pray about it. We began to seek the Lord. On, on July 4th of 2015, God gave me a word that it was, it was time to go ahead and move to changing the name of the church. So we began to discuss it again anew during that uh, nearly year that Pastor Ham was still with us. We began to kick it around and see if that was something that we really needed to do. I thought it was interesting that it was on July 4th, that's Independence Day, of being set free from tyranny and the things of the enemy trying to come against us and put on us. Well, Pastor Ham, we all know what to be with the Lord last April. And... We had left everything hanging up to that point. So still, I had no intention of making any moves or changes until I felt like it was time to do anything that God was calling us to do. So on July 26, God downloaded me into me the name of Fountain Gate. I didn't even know what Fountain Gate was. I didn't know there was such a thing. So I was worshiping God in my, my prayer closet, and I took this, and I'm a man under authority. I took this to the staff pastor's, we began to discuss it. They felt like this was God. I took this to the presbytery of the church, presented it to them. They said that this, this is God right here for us to do this. Y'all know our name has been drug through the mud over the course of the years. Unjustly, perhaps. But it is the fact of what's happened out there in the community. Perhaps it's, it's just in some way. 
But at any rate, in this season that we're in, this is a season of restoring. This is things can be made as new. And there's a freshness in the spirit of what God's doing here for such a time as this. So in December, last month, there were several confirmations that came forth from several prophets. One of them didn't have a clue of what we were, were planning on doing at that time. And so today we're going to, I'm announcing that we're going to change the name of the church from Believer's Church to Fountain Gate Church, or some derivative of that. Now what that could be would be Fountain Gate Family Church or Fountain Gate Church. Uh, I'm working with our, our attorney on that right now to go ahead and see what name is already taken out there legally. And, and so that, that leaves a little bit of a question on it. But Fountain Gate will certainly be a part of what our name is. Now why Fountain Gate? We need to come back next week, and we're going to see what that actually says. Amen? But what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and remain Believer's Church Incorporated. Believer's Baptist Church Incorporated is actually how the corporation is set up. This will become a ministry of Believer's Baptist Church Incorporated, much like Mount Eagle Institute of Theology, our Bible college, much like uh, Ballard Christian School is, that are uh, subsidiary-type ministries up under the legal covering of Believer's Baptist Church. So that's where we're headed to. This is not going to be overnight. This is going to take some time for us to get there before it will be all implemented. Amen? All right. If everybody will, let's all stand up. To give you a little bit of a preview, the Fountain Gate is a place